Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Tyler Akido. I'm a member of the Apache Beam PMC. I'm a software engineer at Google. And I'm here today to talk about Streaming SQL. Um, I've been thinking about Streaming SQL for a long time. I first started reading papers from the database community like eight years ago when I joined the Millwheel team at Google. Um, and there's a lot of really cool stuff there, but it just never really clicked for me. Uh, and then I got really excited about it again about a year and a half ago when I saw Julian Hyde's talk on the subject at Kafka Summit or something like that. Uh, and so he and I started talking and, and kind of bouncing ideas back and forth. Uh, and, he, and he really wanted to get to this point where we could really figure out how streaming would fit cleanly into you know, react relational algebra, you know, sort of the core underpinnings of SQL. And so we've gone back and forth a bit. Uh, the Beam, Calcite, Flink, and, and even Kafka folks have had you know, various ideas out there that, that kind of all contributed to this. And so this talk is basically me trying to say, this is kind of what I think streaming SQL actually can be to, you know, to really fit this, you know, fit cleanly into relational algebra. Um, so we'll see what you think. Uh, two main sections in this talk. Uh, first one is, is on stream and table theory. Uh, if you don't know what streams and tables are, and at least in the context I'm talking about, we'll get to that and explain it. Uh, the second part then is about streaming SQL itself. Um, and uh, I'm writing a book with my, my friend Ruven and another friend of mine at Google Slava uh, called Streaming Systems, which I call it here simply to say, this talk is basically two of the chapters from that book. So if you really like the talk, you should read the book because there's way more detail in there. If you don't like the talk, don't buy the book. You won't like it. Um, so let's get started with stream and table theory. So. What I mean by stream and table theory is really this thing that the Kafka community has been talking about for a couple of years. Um, and so two good places to start are these blog posts by Martin Kleppman and Jay Kreps. Uh, the idea really comes out of uh, you know, how databases themselves have worked for a long time. If, you know, you've got tape, like we all kind of understand tables, I think, right? Uh, but database, you know, the way database architecture works is you, when you have transactions coming into these tables, uh, they get written to this, you know, serialized into this log. Uh, and then that log is serially appended, you know, serially used to apply these transactions to the table itself. It gives you these nice consistency semantics. Well, that log is essentially the stream that we're talking about. So from that, you can kind of see how, you know, streams and tape, you know, you can have a stream and it turns into a table. It's, it's sort of like applying these updates onto this, this table to, to render it. And the idea then of, of getting streams back from tables really comes from uh, the world of materialized views. So if you think of a materialized view as, as a sort of a standing query on an existing table uh, that gives you a new view of the data in that table, but is continuously updated as the, the original table itself is updated, you know, this is all based off of that same change log. So as, as a source table is, is updated, you've got this change log that tells you everything that happened along the way. And so these change logs from sort of the evolution of the table, well, that's sort of how you get streams out of tables. And so from, and, and this is kind of the sort of stuff they talk about in these blog posts. From these uh, ideas, you, you can come up with what I'm going to call here the special theory of, of stream and table relativity, to use a, a kind of a bad physics analogy. Um, you know, so streams, streams become tables, or how do you go from streams to tables? Well, the aggregation of a stream of updates over time yields you a table, and then conversely, uh, you know, the observation of changes uh, to a table over time gives you a stream. And so this is really useful to sort of under, understand how they relate to one another. Uh, it's also useful to understand how they sort of define them in and of themselves. And so the, the most concise definitions I like that kind of give you a really good sense for, for what tables and streams are is that tables are data at rest. They're like this conceptual gathering place for data to accumulate. And streams are data in motion. They're data moving. They're sort of, they, they capture some essence of, of the data at some point, and they're moving on to another location. And we'll see more examples of, of why these explanations of, of sort of rest and motion really make sense. So that's kind of the, the basics of stream and table theory from you know, what those blog posts and what folks have been talking about. So what I want to do in this next section is relate those uh, to the beam model. So how many of you are familiar with the beam model or the data flow model? Okay, so there's at least like 10 of you, good. Um, so uh, what I mean by this is, is really the, the sort of the, the, the model around you know, robust out of order stream processing that we have in Apache Beam came from Google Cloud Dataflow. And honestly, a lot of, a lot of the different tools uh, that we all use in the data processing space are kind of trying to adopt uh, many of these ideas. Um, so uh, if you were at Ruben's talk, uh, in the same room last time. He went through these in great detail. So the, the Beam model is really built around these four questions that, that allow you to frame how you think about data processing. So you know, what results am I calculating? Are we doing sums or averages? You know, where in event time 
are they being calculated? Is this you know, fixed windows of time? Is it global windows? Like, I, you know, I don't care about time. Uh, processing time, are results materialized? You know, do, do you want a single answer for every window that you know, kind of you think gives you a complete answer, or do you want to have regular updates? Uh, and if you have you know, multiple results for a given window, how do refinements of those results relate? Uh, so we will uh, look at these a little more detail, but I think from the perspective of reconciling the beam model with streams and tables, there's really three major questions that are worth exploring. One is, how does batch processing fit into all this? Um, because all the streams and table stuff from the Kafka community has really been focused on stream processing. And, and my argument is that streams and tables are really relevant to data processing in general, but you need to understand like how, you know, how does it fit with batch processing? Batch processing doesn't deal with you know, streams of unbounded data, right? So that's an interesting question to answer. Um, I guess I just called out the second one there, sort of what is the, real, what is the relationship of streams uh, to bounded and unbounded data sets? And then lastly, we want to answer this question of how, you know, how does the, the full beam model that, that gives you this power to deal with out of order streaming data, uh, you know, how does that all relate to streams and tables world? So uh, we're going to explore this uh, via sort of the classic batch processing uh, paradigm of MapReduce, which hopefully most of you are relatively familiar with. Um, you got an input source, an output source, and it goes through this data processing pipeline. It's really two phases, the map phase, the reduce phase. Mapping is kind of this element-wise processing, reducing, you know, between map and reduce, there's this, this shuffle thing that kind of groups stuff together. And then once you've got things key grouped, the reduce takes those key grouped sets of values and you can do something with them, reduce them down to some other value. Uh, for our purposes, it's actually gonna be better to not skip slides. Uh, it's, okay, this thing is jumpy. All right, so I'm not using that. All right, so it's gonna be better to have uh, six, uh, six stages. So for each the map phase and the reduce phase, assume it's broken down into a read phase, you know, the core actual map or reduce phase that kind of runs the user code and then a write phase. Uh, but in between each of these stages, uh, you know, there's, there's sort of data existing in some form. And, and what I really want to answer is, you know, what, what form are they in there? Are they tables or are they streams? Um, and since, uh, since this is batch processing, you know, you start and you end with these static, unchanging data sets, I think it's relatively fair to assume that we all kind of have this feeling that these, you know, we start with table and we end with a table, right? So we'll just, we'll just use that as an assumption. But what's in the middle? All right, so to start with, let's focus on the map phase. So what happens here uh, is the, the map read phase takes this table and it scans through it, right? And maybe it's doing this in parallel or maybe it's doing it serially, whatever. But it scans through this table and it takes these data and it sends them off to the map, map phase. And the map phase is processing them. And so is, that, is it sending it as a table or as a stream? Well, a very useful way to figure this out is to look at the APIs that are involved. So this is roughly what a Java uh, map function might look like. You know, it takes in two inputs, a, a key and a value, and then it gets this object, that, this emit object that allows you to produce some number of outputs, arbitrary number, it could be zero to n, right? Uh, and the outputs have a different type of key and a different value, and, and you know, each individual output from a given call can have a, a different key from any other emit calls. So uh, essentially, there's, there's nothing really binding any of this stuff together. Uh, and importantly, each each call gives you a single key and a single value. So it's really like you know, the, the data gets scanned by the read phase and then it gets handed off and one by one, you know, it's, it's processing each of these elements. And that really starts to sound like it's a stream, right? Uh, so I would, I would postulate that you know, the map read phase essentially takes a table, reads it into a stream and hands it off to the map phase. So then what does the map phase output? Well, again, let's look at the function signature and see you know, the output uh, has a submit thing. So, this lets you emit key value pairs, but as I, as I noted earlier, they, they have nothing, you know, they're not associated in any way. Like these keys aren't grouped together, they can be arbitrary keys, it's really just spewing out random key value pairs. Uh, so what, in, in essence, what it's doing here, like there's no grouping, there's nothing here to, to stop the data. All these data that are coming in as a stream are staying in motion. And the, the, new, the stream that's producing this on the other side, uh, it may be of different cardinality, you know, it may be smaller cardinality or larger cardinality, or it may be, you know, one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, but it, the data stay in motion. So the result of the map phase then is, is also a stream. That then brings us to the map write phase. So to understand what happens here, let's also add in the function signature for reduce. Because we want to take the output of the map, which is this sort of random bag of, of key value elements, and later on something's going to happen and then we're going to consume them as key iterable of, of value pairs. 
So what's happening here is that shuffle operation I talked about is, is taking every record that has a, a specific key associated with it and grouping it with all the other records uh, that, that have that same key. And in order to do that, you've got these streams of data that are in motion throughout the pipeline. They have to come to rest somewhere. They come to rest at that location that, that addresses all of the elements for that given key. And so this is a grouping operation that's, that's turning that stream into a table. And so that we can see that here is that we, you know, the, the map write phase effectively then creates a table. So then if we look at the rest of the pipeline, um, as you can imagine, the rest of it actually looks pretty similar. So we'll go through it a little faster. Um, uh, as before, you know, the, the reduce phase, what does it take in? Well, it gets a key and it gets this iterable V2 thing. So it sounds kind of like it's getting lots of values, but really the iterable itself is just this big composite value. So this isn't really anything different than what we had in the map phase. And similarly, the, the emit is essentially no different. There's no key on this, because this is, this is sort of in the spirit of the original MapReduce implementation. But there is one interesting thing I should call out here, is that the original MapReduce uh, gave you two options with reduce. You could either, and this was like a flag specified on the job, you could either have the outputs of, of the reduce associated with the key they came in on. So, you know, it comes in on the, this input K2. It could have that be associated with that same key when it went out. Or they could just be unkeyed, essentially, you know, sort of data with no keys. Um, and I'll, I'll explain why that's important in a second. Um, so, uh, so from seeing that reduce read and reduce are really no different than, than map, we kind of see that those are streams. But the, the important thing is, is reduce write. Um, as I said, you, you don't necessarily have a key associated uh, with the outputs from reduce. So how do we know that we end up with a table here? Because otherwise the data would have to stay in motion if they aren't being grouped in some way and, and brought, brought to rest. And, th and so it's, it's pretty obvious in the case of where you use those, those implicit keys, because you know, then you're grouping by keys. But what happens in the case of, of unkeyed data is that the system knows it has to write a table. Uh, and so it, it, instead of using some user supplied key, it's essentially using some physical offset that uniquely identifies this row. This is a lot like in SQL, if you have a table that has no primary key or anything to it and you insert a row to it, the database system itself needs to know how to uniquely identify that, that row and it does so with this hidden physical offset at, you know, in some B tree or whatever the implementation is. The user never sees, uh, but, but you know, it really is, this, it's, it's this grouping operation that's grouping each record by this physical offset that happens to have only with it, and it was weird. Happens to only have one record associated with it, uh, but creating a table. All right, so at this point, uh, we know enough, I think, to answer at least the first two questions. So how does batch processing fit into all this? Well, tables are read in streams. Streams are processed into new streams until a grouping operation is hit. Grouping turns the stream into a table, uh, and then you just sort of repeat steps one through three until you run out of operations. Uh, and we're also uh, in a good position to answer the second question, so what is the relationship of streams to bounded and unbounded data sets? Well, streams are just the in-motion form of data, both bounded un and unbounded. Um, so as you can see in this case, you know, we had these bounded static input tables that we then converted into streams, and the fact that they ended didn't really have anything to do with the fact that it was in this you know, in-motion stream form. So that leaves us with this last question. How do the four what, when, where, and how questions map onto a streams and tables world? So now what I'm gonna do is walk you through uh, these questions uh, a little more in detail. So if, again, if you went to Ruben's talk, I'm like walking through the exact same example, but we're gonna look at different versions of the animations, and I'm also gonna walk through it a lot faster uh, because I don't have time to go uh, quite as deep. So apologies if you get lost, but the, the important thing you'll see are the animations. Um, so we're gonna start out with, with the first question, what results are calculated? Uh, and to do this, we're going to look at an example beam pipeline. So this is sort of pseudo Java-ish code for a pipeline that, that's just consuming in some data set. That's the io.read call. Uh, it's parsing it into key value pairs of, of user and score. So imagine this is for some mobile game or you know, mobile game app or something. Users are playing as they score points. The scores are transmitted to a server. And we have this pipeline that we built that we want to sum up these scores, right? Uh, so they're coming in, or I guess I'm saying that we're, we're summing up team scores. My bad. So you know, each, each user's score comes in, it's tagged with the team for the, the user, and we want to calculate a given team score across all of its users. So we're going to parse it into a team score pair, and then we're going to uh, call this sum.integers per key composite transform, which is going to group all of the records with the same team together and sum them up. So here's an animation that shows what you would look, this would look like if we ran this as a classic batch pipeline. 
And there's a lot going on here, so I'm going to kind of walk you through all the pieces. So if you've seen any of my animations before, it's sort of similar in that there's, a, there's an x-axis that's event time, and there's a y-axis that's processing time. So the event time is when events actually happen. Processing time is sort of the time as the pipeline observes it, right? Unlike my old, app, old animations, where you kind of had this static graph with a, a horizontal line going up that shows you time progressing, this actually has the full, the full field of the graph scrolling to kind of represent time, kind of like those piano roll things or the you know, automatic piano playing thing. Um, what's nice about this is I can annotate on the left kind of the state of, of the data at any point. That's what's in parentheses. And if there's not parentheses, then it's a specific transform. So this one has the parse transform and the sum transform. And in between there, I tell you kind of what the state of the data, data are in. So it starts out as these raw bytes. Once it gets parsed, it's turned into per user scores. Then it hits the summation operation that's summing these user scores by team. And then after that, we end up with team scores. And then on the right, I've annotated each section to show you which part, you know, at what point the data are in what, what sort of format. They're in a stream, they get parsed, they remain in a stream, they hit the summation operation, they turn into a table, and then finally, once the output comes out, you get another stream again. Uh, and so the, the, the really interesting thing to point out here is that you, know, you see these data flowing through and they're, they're coming in a stream because they've already been read and they hit that parse operation. It does nothing to, to, to bring them to rest. They just keep flowing, right? It transforms them into these you know, new parsed records, but they keep flowing until they hit this grouping summation operation. And there they, they come to rest. They stop and they start to accumulate. And that's where our, 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 our uh, team score starts to accumulate. And it's not until we reach the end of the input, because that's, that's how batch processing works, uh, that we actually trigger that, that table into a stream uh, and produce the, the result downstream. So that's the first question. Let's move on to the second one. Where in event time are results calculated? So this relates to windowing. Um, here are three examples of three types of windowing, fixed sliding and sessions. I don't have time to go into them very much. Uh, Here's the code that you would add in Beam to, to say, hey, I want, I want to actually you know, pr perform these, these summation uh, operations within fixed windows of two time minutes uh, width. The, what's important here is if you come and look at the animation again, this looks almost exactly the same as the last one, except once you get to the summation operation, you can see we're now summing over these four separate windows, right, that are each two minutes wide. Uh, and so the point here is that windowing you know, it doesn't do anything to the parse operation. It has no effect to it whatsoever. So, you know, the stream-to-stream -stream operation, it could care less about windowing. Where it shows up is in this grouping operation. So windowing is really a, a modification of, of grouping. It's, it's sort of like a secondary key in some sense. And there's also a whole bunch of other stuff around, like, merging windows when you talk about windows that I don't have time to go into here, but I do, I do discuss in the book because there's actually some, some more important stuff around multi-row transactions and things. Um, but this is the main takeaway for windowing. And this is still batch, you can see, because we wait until the end of the input to give, it, give a result. And the problem there, of course, is that we, you know, we've, we've windowed this. You know, in some sense, we're saying, well, I kind of care about these data you know, in these, these fixed intervals. Um, but presumably, you would kind of want your answers you know, not all at once. Uh, like, kind of like Reuven said, you don't want to wait until the end of time or until your company goes bankrupt uh, to, to say, OK, well, here's all our results. Uh, and so, so to fix that, then we go to the next question. You know, when in processing time are, are results materialized? And this is answered with a combination of triggers and watermarks. And again, I don't really have time to go into them in, in great depth, but you know, triggers basically make this statement of when you want the results to come out. Watermarks are this useful, useful way to reason about uh, event time completeness. Uh, and so sometimes they're bound together. But in this case, we're going to say, OK, I, I, want a, I want a watermark trigger. And what this really means is we're saying whenever the watermark, this estimate of, of input completeness, passes the end of the window, uh, I, want to, uh, I want to produce a, a single result. And so what that looks like is this. You can see this, that green squiggly line in there is our, our watermark estimate. And every time the watermark passes the end of the window, we treat that as a condition for saying, you know, this, we think this input is complete. We're going to go ahead and produce it out. And so this, you can see, the, the, you know, the use of the trigger guided by the watermark has materially affected the shape of that, that stream at the bottom. Like, it's really dictated. How do, we, how do we convert that table into a stream? Um, and there's also a downside in this case. This is a, a heuristic watermark, so it's an estimate. So we missed that 9. And you can see that we, we gave a, for the first window, we give a, a, a value of 5, and it really should have been 14. But the watermark was wrong, and it thought we'd seen all the input data, so we went ahead and uh, gave the wrong answer. So this actually calls out two important points. One is, um, if you're familiar with the whole uh, queryable state or stream processor as a database thing, this is, what, this is the point they're, they're making. 
uh, instead of trying to consume the output as a stream, what you can instead do is just, if you can read from your tables directly as their computing state, you don't have to worry about this stuff as much. Like if you're just querying, you know, once the nine shows up, if you go to query that first window, you'll see that the value is 14. You don't have to deal with triggers or watermarks or anything like that. It's actually kind of handy. But if you do want to consume the output as a stream, you do have to worry about that. And so that's where the you know, additional triggers and the last question can come into play. So how do refinements or results relate? So we're gonna add this gross looking trigger on here. I apologize, our, our Java uh, trigger syntax is atrocious. And this is actually a shortened version of it, so I'm a little sorry to say. So ignoring the fact that our API is, is way too verbose, um, this is basically saying, hey, you know, we, we used to fire when the watermark passed the end of the window. I'd also like early speculative updates. So every once a minute, if you have something new, but you know, we don't think the window's complete, go ahead and give me a speculative one anyway. Uh, and then once the watermark passes, if anything shows up late, just give it to me immediately. That's what that at count part is. And the accumulation mode thing, the accumulating fired panes, just means every time you give me a new, a new answer, make sure you include everything from the last answer. Keep accumulating values. Basically, I could use this to overwrite the previous value. And you can see that this, again, materially changes the shape of, of the stream that comes out of the table, but basically does nothing else to the rest of it. And so in this case, you know, sometimes we're, for some of them we have on times, for some we have these, these early panes that are kind of giving you periodic updates, and then when that nine shows up, we get that late record, you know, letting us ultimately have the right answer in the stream as well. So, you know, in summary, you know, the, the stuff we saw here was that you know, we, we kind of saw how streams and tables behaved. We saw that how windowing act as this sort of grouping mechanism here. Uh, and then we saw how triggers and watermarks and things can really affect the way that, that tables and streams, or, or tables become streams. And, and so uh, with all of this, I think we're, we're more or less in a position where we can start to answer this last question. So taking this and everything from the first section together, I would postulate that this is a, a, a general theory of, of stream and table relativity. Again, the bad physics joke. But um, so you know, pipe, you have pipelines. Pipelines are t tables and streams and operations. Tables are data at rest. Streams are data in motion. And then you have these operations that consume a stream or a table and give you a stream or a table on the other side. And there's basically four categories of these. There's stream to stream operations. These are non-grouping, element-wise operations. They they leave the stream in motion and they yield a new stream, possibly of, of different cardinality. You got stream to table operations. These are grouping operations. These bring the data, the, the data in the stream that's in motion to rest, yielding a table. Uh, and windowing, as we saw, is, is sort of adds a dimension of time to this grouping. Then there's table to stream operations. These are ungrouping or triggering operations. This puts these take data that's you know been accumulating and sitting at rest in a table and puts it into motion, uh, yielding a stream. And you know, the types of triggers that you put on the table and the, the accumulation modes specified dictate the nature and shape of the stream. Uh, and then lastly, we have uh, table, table operations, which don't exist. There are none, because you can't have data that's at rest and have it go into, you know, come back to rest without going to motion in between. So you always have to have a stream in between. And so with this, we've, we've more or less have, a, have a, a decent understanding of, of you know, how streams and tables relate to you know, robust out-of-order processing, how they relate to the beam model, how they relate to themselves, kind of what all this means. So this, this concludes our, our stream and table section. And now we're gonna move on to SQL. Uh, and this is gonna be in two sections. The first part is gonna talk about sort of the conceptual underpinning that makes streaming SQL just work really well. And then we'll, then we'll talk specifically about SQL language extensions, uh, which is maybe what most of you thought this talk might be. So the, the basis, the, the theoretical basis for SQL is uh, the rel relational algebra. Uh, so a relation is, is really m very much akin to what we kind of think of as a database table, right? It's this, it's this mapping of, uh, you know, sort of named type columns of data and, and, and like this, you know, it's two dimensional, right? So it's the, the X axis has these named type columns uh, and the, the Y axis has, you know, values for each of those columns. So it gives you this relationship between uh, data and these attributes. Um, and on top of this, then, there's this mathy thing called relational algebra uh, that has all these operations you can apply to these sets of data uh, and yield new sets. And so one that I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with is projection, basically selecting specific attributes out of a, a relation to yield a new relation. So in this case, the example I have is projecting to just the score and time fields. So we take this table that has scores, you know, Julie, Julie had a score of seven at 1201, Frank at, at three, and then Julie had two more scores of, of one and four at, at three and, or 1203 and 1207. 
uh, we project that to just have the score and the time. And now we don't actually know who, who made the scores. You know, I, I'm not sure why you would necessarily do that, but that's a thing you can do, right? Uh, and then SQL is this sort of physical manifestation of relational algebra that you can actually use on your computer. And you can do something that, like what we're all familiar with of you know, select score and time from user scores. And it gives you basically the same thing. So uh, there's two important things to note here. One is that relations are, are really sort of the, the, central op the central data object of, of SQL and relation, you know, rela relational algebra. So they're very important. The other is uh, relational algebra is, is a closed language. That means any relational operation you apply to a relation yields you a new relation on the other side that you can then apply any other relational operator to. Like, Anytime you put a re relation in, you get a relation out. This is really important. That makes it very easy to use. You just know you have these operations. You, you apply it to a relation, you get another one. You don't have to worry, like, am I converting between things? Like, what's, what's going on here? A lot of streaming SQL stuff that's been proposed in the past really, uh, kind of has a hard time allowing you to apply the full suite of sort of SQL and relational algebra operations to, to streams and tables. And so we'll see what, what we can do to, to fix that. So another key insight is that relations really evolve over time. You know, so, so I, you know, I kind of talked through what the data in this table were. There, you know, there are scores arriving. And if we had queried this table at different times, you can see in green I've got the, the, the query times up there, the table would have looked very different. And when you're starting to talk about stream processing, you're really adding the dimension of time into, into the equation. And, and so how the table evolves over time is, is actually really important. And this gets to the, really, I think, the key insight of, of how you make streaming, streaming SQL work is that you've got classic SQL, right? It deals with these classic relations that really capture a single point in time. But when you want to deal with streaming, you want to deal with a thing that, that Julian Hyde, I believe, coined as time-varying relations. They capture the state of a relation all time, every point in time. And so what, what exactly do I mean by this? Um, oh, yeah, I'm highlighting that because that's important. Um, so the, this was our, you know, our, our original relation that we viewed at four different points in time. Well, if you were to, to query this, in some theoretical system that supported time-varying relations naturally at 1207, you'd get back this. This is really a three-dimensional object, right? We, we, we highlighted that relations are these two-dimensional things with you know, sort of name-type columns in the, in the x-axis and then values in the y-axis. Well, a time-varying relation adds a z-axis of time. And it basically captures this, the full state of the relation at every point in time. Um, and in this case, it's a very compressed form that kind of gives you time ranges, uh, but essentially lets you, lets you reason about the table or the relation as it exists over all of time. Uh, and what's, uh, what's really important about this, right, did I skip a, yes, I somehow skipped one. Okay, what's really important about this uh, is that if you look at the two, you know, we've got this kind of sequence of classic relations, right? It really looks very similar to this time-varying relation. So what's awesome here is that the application of any relational operator that exists now to a time-varying relation is exactly the same as the operation of that or the application of that operator to each of those individual classic relations in sequence. And if you did that, if you took that relational operator and applied it to each of those classic relations, you get out another sequence of classic relations because of the closure property, which means you get out another time-varying relation. So the, the really critical thing that you get when you think about them this way is that the closure property of relational algebra remains intact with these time-varying relations. You're now dealing with you know, relations over time and this, this important dimension that you need for streaming, but everything you could do in SQL before continues to work. This is fantastic. To see this in action, like here's our, here's our kind of base time-varying relation again, right? Um, so let's say we modify this. You know, this is just a select star from user scores. Uh, let's say we add a where clause and do some filtering. It just works. You know, the, the Frank's lines disappear. Let's say we want to do grouping. This is one of the things that, that, that always confuses people when they're like trying to deal with streaming SQL. Like, what does grouping mean? Let's do a grouping operation. It just works. Like, we've got Julie scores, we've got Frank scores. Uh, and you know, those are sort of the, the, the four relations. So this is really cool from a theoretical perspective, uh, but uh, I can imagine some of you are, are wondering, you know, how does this actually relate to streams and tables? Like nobody's gonna use time-bearing relations. You can imagine how massive these things, if they actually existed, would get if you, if you did it on a real database. Like it's not practical. What you really want are to interact with this, with you know, these things that we're, we're used to on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's look and see. 
So again, we're looking here at our example time varying relation, and we're, we've, we're querying it. This is the relation that has grouping, remember? Uh, so you know, as Julie's multiple scores come in, you can see that her score uh, continues to increase because we're grouping and summing uh, as they show up. So 1201, her score is seven. Her second score of one comes in at 1203, so her score goes up to eight. And then four comes in at 1207, her score goes up to 12. So how time varying relations relate to tables? Well, we've actually already kind of discussed this. Like a table is basically a, a snapshot in a point in time of the time varying relation, right? So if you, if you uh, queried it uh, as a table, I've, I've kind of put in this little table keyword here to say, you know, hey, I'm, I'm querying a time varying relation, but I, I want a table view of it from, for right now. At, at 12 o'clock, there'd be nothing. Uh, at uh, 12.01, you know, her first score arrives. At 12.03, we've got that, and, and 12.07. So really, they're, they're just this, this uh, sequence of, of, of classic relations that already exist in there, right? Um, and the cool thing about SQL is they actually already have some amount of support in this. So like this, the 2011 SQL standard um, has this thing that lets you query a table, a, a temporal table, at a specific point in time. So let's say we, we wanted to see what the table looked like at 1201, but it was later, like 1207. You can actually do a, you know, a select table name as of system time 1201 and, and get that back. Like this is a thing that actually exists. Um, so there's, there's precedence for this idea already in, in the SQL language. Um, so what about streams? Streams are actually a little more interesting. Uh, so if we query a stream at, at 12 o'clock, um, uh, we'll get something that looks very similar to if we had queried the table, and note, note the table and the, the stream keywords there. That's how we're distinguishing what, what it is we're getting. But the difference here is that the, the stream is not closed off, right? It's got this ellipsis down here that's implying there's more data that may come. Uh, and it's, it, if you'd actually run this command, it would, it would hang, because it's just waiting to see what else is coming, because it's this unbounded stream. Uh, but the two look very similar at this point in time. There's no data, fine. Uh, if time advances to 1201, then, then Julie's first score shows up. And again, if we queried the table to see what it looked like, they'd actually look pretty similar. Um, time advances again. Um, then Julie's uh, second score of one shows up. And you can see the stream now is telling us, well, Julie got an updated score uh, of eight. And it's adding that to the stream. Like it, it, can't, it's, it can't do anything to change what happened in the past. The stream is this sort of append-only log kind of construct, right? Well, it's added Julie's new score to it. So you can see at this point, this looks very different than from the table if you query the table at 12.03. And similarly, as, as uh, you know, time advances again, she, we get a new score for Julie. And, but if you query the table, it looks very different. This is a very important point. Streams and tables are very different things. There, there are some attempts at sort of understanding SQL in the streaming realm that, that try to have you think about it. If, you know, streams are just tables, right? It's cool. Don't, don't worry about them. Just treat them as append-only tables. Everything will be fine. And, and in the sense that like, they're really kind of getting at this notion of time-varying relations under the cover, that, that's actually true. Like, you know, if, if it really is a time-varying relation, then, then all of the operations work. But it's really important to keep in mind that streams and tables are such different beasts. Like you can't trade one for the other just arbitrarily. Like they have very different uses, very different characteristics. It's really important to, to remember that they are different views on the same underlying structure. Um, and so, uh, so with that, then we have a good a good sense of of saying you know, how how do time varying relations relate uh, to streams and tables? Well, tables capture a point in time snapshot of a time varying relation. And streams capture the evolution of a time varying relation over time. So that brings us to the last section, uh, which is SQL language extensions. So the big question here is, you know, what do you actually, what do you actually need as far as language extensions uh, to support streaming well? Because this is the part that, that nobody likes, right? Like everybody wants to use standard SQL. Nobody uses the same extensions, the, and so life just sucks, right? Well, the awesome thing is if you have good defaults, it's actually often not needed. And when the defaults aren't good enough, it really kind of boils down to how the output of the query is consumed. If the output is consumed as a table, you really rarely need SQL extensions. Uh, it's really when you start wanting to consume streams directly that you need to worry about this. So the, the table point is interesting. The, the reason for that is that SQL is a very table-centric uh, system, right? It's always centered around tables. Uh, but it's also had streaming built into it for a long time. Like, like materialized views, these basically are, are streaming queries, uh, but you consume them as tables. So it, like everything in SQL works very naturally with tables, even if you're starting to talk about uh, streaming. It's really when the streams get into play. And so here, 
is kind of a summary of the main things that you would want as, as language extensions. And, the, and the, the, the two on the top are kind of the big ones. So I already showed you the, the select table and select stream. Like these are just ways of saying, you know, I know I'm querying this thing uh, that can be either a table or a stream, and I want to tell you exactly what I want. I, I want it as a table or I want it as a stream. But you, you honestly don't really even need to use those very often because if you have good same defaults, which I have on the right, you know, if all of your inputs are tables, a reasonable default is to have the output be a table. This is just the classic query that we've all ever dealt with, right? And if any of the inputs are actually streams, well, then a good default is for the output to be a stream because you probably want to speak and deal in streams. And if you want to you consume the output as a table, you can say so. Or if you've got a bunch of in, in, tables that you're querying and you want to you actually stream the results of the query out, then you can say, give me a stream of it. Beyond that, the stuff in the lower section is, is really, to, really things that help you deal with, with streaming. Uh, and particularly how you uh, convert tables into streams in the case that you actually want to uh, view these streams. Uh, so the, the first is, is timestamps and windowing. So this, this goes back to you know, the importance of windowing when you're dealing with out-of-order data and things like that. Um, so there's, there's some extensions that have been added to Apache CalCite, for example, that allow you to uh, specify a windowing uh, term or a windowing you know, strategy uh, as part of a group by. So I want to select from X and group by a session over some time, you know, some timestamp column that sort of dictates the session shape, and over, you know, here's some interval. Um, and uh, the main thing this gets you is, is the ability uh, to really latch on to those windows with watermark triggers later on if you want to use those to, uh, to dictate when you emit results. The other nice thing, which I kind of alluded to earlier, is when you have these merging, complex dynamic merging windows like sessions, like you can't actually, ex you can't actually express that in declarative SQL. Uh, and so, because it, it involves these weird multi-row transactions that merge rows together as, as, as rows, you know, sort of figure arrive and, and are within this, this time interval bound that you've declared that really needs to be baked into the system. So this gives you a way to express this complex thing that you can't otherwise express in SQL. So that's, you know, even if you're not even doing streaming, that's actually a useful thing to have. Um, and then as far as you know, shaping what your streams look like when you wanna, if you want to uh, consume a stream directly, you have a few options. One that I, I had meant to put on here but I didn't is uh, if you're selecting into a data, so like let's say you've got some sync. Let's say you've got some sync that you're writing to uh, and you're gonna write this stream to it. So you're gonna select into this, this stream or whatever. Like whatever the nature of that sync is, maybe it's Kafka or maybe it's Google PubSub or something, like the nature of that stream probably actually dictates what you want the stream to look like. So in a lot of cases, you can actually configure your syncs to just tell the system, like trigger, you know, trigger it in this way, the way that I, you know, shape the stream in a way that I can actually consume it. Uh, like if you're, if you're writing to like HBase, you know, where you've got keyed output and you can actually overwrite values, you could say, you know, give me, give me accumulating mode because I don't need to know retractions that you, know, you replace the previous value. I can just overwrite previous values. So in that case, like the person who builds the sync and actually knows, you know, knows very deeply how these things work can specify that and then things can just work when you hook them up. Um, another one is that you can optionally configure this outside of the query. So this is what Kafka Streams does. This is essentially what structured streaming does. Uh, they just kind of have this, this uh, regular heartbeat uh, of triggering, and you can specify outside of the pipeline, you know, I want this to happen every five seconds, or I want it to happen every minute. And then lastly, if you're in a pure SQL world and you really want to be able to, to specify this, you could, have, you could add an extension that says, you know, select star from and emit and some statement that tells you when to emit, that answers that when question. Um, and I would argue that, you know, like in Beam, we've got this ridiculous set of triggers that do all sorts of crazy things that almost nobody uses, you know, except for a very focused set of use cases. I think we should probably just have these focused set of use cases. This, you know, basically what folks do is they want periodic processing time heartbeats, like you get with Kafka Streams or Spark Streaming, or they want something around watermarks, uh, because watermarks are really useful when you want a single answer, like you can't, uh, you can't use these periodic processing heartbeats to consume a stream that gives you a single answer per window. It just doesn't work. You have to write it into a table and you have to poll it and polling at large, you know, for large key spaces sucks. Nobody wants to do that. Uh, so watermarks are really handy and if you throw them out, you're, you're missing a bunch of use cases. But once you've got periodic processing time heartbeats and, and watermarks and maybe the combination of the two to get early and late, uh, that's kind of all you need. And so that's basically it. So, you know, in summary, and we kind of learned about streams and tables. We learned how they relate to each other and kind of what they mean at a basic level. 
Uh, we learned how they relate to the B model, and we had this you know, sort of general theory of stream and table relativity that talked about tables and streams and you know, stream stream operations, which are these element wise things that, that leave stream data in motion. And then you've got the, the stream to table operations that, that are the grouping operations that, that take the data and bring it to rest. And you've got the table to stream operations, these triggering operations that ungroup data and, and bring it back into motion. And you've got this table to table thing that doesn't actually exist. Table to table operations just don't exist. And we talked about time bearing relations, which take you know, the core data object in SQL that you know, currently represents a single relation in time and replace it with this thing that's very similar but captures the full state of that relation over time, adds that time dimension as another axis. And then lastly, we talked about a few SQL language extensions that can allow you to reason about this more and, and also, most importantly, sane defaults that let you not have to deal with extensions and let you do streaming in SQL in a lot, you know, a vast majority of the cases without even, you know, just with standard SQL as it exists today. Uh, and with that, that's all I have. So uh, here's a link to the slides. Uh, some other resources on here. So there's, I've been trying to work with Julian Hyde and also the Apex and the Beam and the Calcite and the Flink communities to kind of discuss, you know, what what streaming might might streaming and SQL might look like. That's where a lot of these ideas came from. Uh, that first doc there uh, is where I'm trying to capture everything. Uh, it currently doesn't represent everything that's in this talk. It's like two or three generations old, I need to go through and, and update it. So it's a, it's a bit of a disaster at the moment. But, um, and then there's a couple other docs uh, from, from Julian uh, that were really big motivations for uh, some of the stuff in here. Uh, if you want to know more about the Beam model that I kind of sprinted through, uh, Streaming 102 covers it in, in pretty big detail. Uh, there's links to the, the various Apache projects that I was talking about. And of course, the book, if you want to read in more detail, uh, the two chapters that I was sprinting through here. Uh, and otherwise, I can probably take like half of a question or something. You. So I, I should have, yeah, I, it would have been nice if I, if I could have talked. So there's a lot going on in the SQL world. Um, you've really got, so Apache Flink has had has streaming SQL for like a year and a half. And they've been, they've been pushing a lot of interesting stuff in there. Um, they added these undo, undo redo streams. They have retractions in them that I haven't seen anybody else do. So like, I think the most advanced stuff currently is in, is in uh, Flink. Uh, structured streaming and KSQL, both are, both are basically the like, materialized view kind of a thing with periodic updates. Um, the really awesome thing about KSQL is that it's integrated into their metadata uh, you know, management system. So you can do pure SQL stuff, you know, no code whatsoever. Uh, Beam is going to have a SQL DSL available in the upcoming 2.20 release uh, that Reuven has valiantly been trying to cut this week. Uh, so that should be out soon. That lets you basically take a Beam P transform and, and write it as SQL. So you've got some columnar P collection. You then apply a SQL statement that it could get expanded into something arbitrary. We've got group by, we've got join, we've got a bunch of filtering stuff in it. And then you get a P collection out. And this lets you insert SQL into your Java pipeline. Um, and so what I've been trying to do with the, the spec thing is, is get together everybody that's using CalCite, which is basically, so far at least, those four, those four groups have contributed. We see this is happening in kind of open source or like the other way. What's happening in Google itself? It's Google sometimes produces something completely different many times. So I'm, I'm probably the one who's most vocally leading these, you know, we should do streaming and SQL thing within Google as well. And so I want it to match the open source stuff. My, my goal is to have open source and whatever we, we end up using at Google. Yes. And that's a big reason why I'm doing this is I would like all of the open source. I'd like everybody to use this. Like, it sucks having SQL variations, right? It'd be nice if we could all just agree, this is what we want. This is what we need. We all kind of do the same thing anyway. Just let's, you know. So that's what I'm trying to do. Anyone else before I get kicked off? Yes. Uh huh. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, so the question, if I can paraphrase it, was 
There are a lot of operations that, particularly the associative commutative ones, where you can, as you're storing state for these, you can really collapse it down, right? Like summation, you don't have to store all of your inputs, you store the partial sum, or even average, like you store the sum and the count, and from that you can derive a mean, and so it allows you to store data over time, but things like distinct or whatever, you, have, you actually have to store the full data set, and this doesn't scale well for certain workloads, right? And so is there a better way to, to deal with that? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> There are, there are approximation algorithms for some of those that, that are better, but like at the end of the day, if you, if you need all of the inputs to calculate something, you need all the inputs. And so you know, when I get all excited and say everything in SQL totally works, I mean, theoretically it does, but if you're talking like really large data, you know, there's just some things you can't do, right? Like you know, if you do a cube over a massive data set, you're gonna get an even more massive data set and have a really bad day. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh. So, in my opinion, all joins are stream to stream joins. Uh, stream stream, like it, it depends on how you consume the stream, like or the like. You can do stream to table joins, and depending on how you consume the table, it, it shapes how the join looks like. Like you can treat it as kind of a lookup. A lookup join is effectively like you trigger the entire table once, and you kind of store it in your state, and then you just join it with the stream as it comes in. Uh, or you can, you can sort of join with the evolution of the table over time. That's really like I'm triggering that table into a, a stream, and as it comes, I'm, I'm joining things together. Um, Julian's doc, the, the stream, streams, joins, and temporal tables is a really good one. And then there's more in the spec, too, on temporal joins. Like, half of that doc is on temporal joins, because it's, it's interesting. I was just going to say, they're going to take a couple of minutes to set up. Do you want to hang out here and take questions? Yeah, I'll be, I'll be around. So if you have questions, come.